Listen, I don't normally preach for notes. I promise you, I'm not a note preacher. Not in any way, form, or fashion. But if I hadn't got six pages of notes right there, I'm not standing here. But don't get worried. It's the type that I can slip. I can skip to the last page at any moment and finish up. Hallelujah. I, I wore the prosperity shirt tonight. <clears throat> I don't know. It's just something about Hawaiian print makes you feel prosperous. And, <laughs> maybe you got a condo in Hawaii, you know. Uh, maybe P.I. used to live, whatever. In the third epistle of John, the second verse, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to shake anybody up here if I say this, I know. But we're going to look real close at what John was saying here in this, this verse of Scripture. We're going we're gonna to look at it maybe in a way that you had never looked at it before. And that's okay. Because I'm not going to say anything that would hinder the way you have always looked at the Scripture. I just want you to look at it a little bit different tonight. Hallelujah. Paul, I mean, excuse me, Paul. John was writing this to Gainus. Gainus, the name of Gainus, is mentioned five or six times in the New Testament. And we're not sure it's the same Gainus. There's, there's no real way to connect to see. But even if it is the same Gainus, we get the same, we, we, we come to the same conclusion. Most Bible scholars tend to believe that uh, all three epistles of John, and especially the third one, was written in the latter part of the century, or the, 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 the first hundred years, around A.D. 65 to 80. Now that puts John as a, an elder, and he calls himself an elder here. It puts him aged. It also puts Gainus, no matter which one he was, no matter how you approach it, it puts uh, an elderly saint of God writing to an elderly saint of God and for encouragement. If you, if you do the history on it, um, and I, I just, just dabble around with the history just a little bit too much. It's not really my thing, but uh, the, the church was entering into that stage where people like John would, would would be sort of over maybe some churches and they would write correspondences to leaders in the churches and different ones in the churches and then in turn those leaders would pass those among different churches and of course among the saints there. But he addresses this to Gainus and I'm going to back up and read the first verse. The elder unto the well-beloved Gainus whom I love in the truth. And he's saying, Gainus, Above everything I can think of, above all that I can imagine or pray for, I pray that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prospers. Now, here's what we're going to look at tonight. And I know I'm just like everyone else here. I always use this scripture as a real prosperity, go get them verse. I wish above all things, Brother Wendell, that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prosper. That works pretty good. Me saying it to Brother Wendell. But just suppose I was saying it to Joe Kool over here. And Joe Kool's soul is not prospering. You see what I'm saying? If Joe Kool over here goes to church twice a year, doesn't even know where his Bible is, let alone read it. And the closest thing he says to prayer is, oh my God, when he goes around the curb down here too fast and meets Lord in the school bus. <laughs> His soul's not prospering. So I say, I wish above all things, Joe Cool, that thou may prosper like thy soul's prospering. I don't think so. Mm -mm. What they want to do tonight is look at the prosperous soul. We're not changing the scripture up. We're not changing the way we use it at all. But we want to look at what a prosperous soul is. 
Because that's what we're going to get to. That's what we're going to get to in our life and in our prayer life. And then we can, we can walk up to somebody and say, hey, well, I wish above all things that I can prosper and be in health like your soul's prospering. But I don't want to put that on somebody if the soul's not prospering. Everybody hear me? Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Because I don't want, I would rather, I'd rather walk around that that parking lot and be stoned than to confuse anybody. That's just the way I feel about it. I think, you know, that once in a while you run up on somebody that gets their kicks off at confusing people, that's not me. No. And if, if, if I ever say it, if I say something here tonight, or if I'm back there in the foyer in the parking lot or anywhere that you don't understand, you give me exactly one chance, just one chance, to clarify it. If I can't clarify it, then you don't have to listen to me anymore. Okay? Because I'm not going to confuse anybody. Uh, if we compare the soul with that body and with prosperity, that's, that's what we need to look at tonight because we can identify with a prosperous body. Okay? We can understand someone who's prospering physically. I'm going to read some notes. These are not all my notes. <laughs> I'm going to read some notes that I, I, I found on this. And there's some of them that are really, really soul enlightening. Uh, if we look at a person who is uh, laying on a table and not moving because they're dead, <clears throat> they're not prospering. The dead man's not prospering. <clears throat> okay. That's what we want to first look at. <clears throat> because if a body is prospering, it must have life in it. Yes. It must have life. Point one. Okay? Yes. For our body to prosper, it must be alive. For our soul to prosper, it must be alive. It must have life in it. If my soul is not, is not demonstrating life, then it's not prospering. Uh, above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospereth, this is what it was praying here. If we look at that, he is saying, soul of Gainus, be alive. Be alive. Be alive. Show me some life. Okay? Life <clears throat> in the basic health, the limbs may be perfectly normal. The face may look just really nice. The hair may be combed just right. Everything about the, the body may be in place just the way it's supposed to be. But there may be a mortician standing over it. You know? It, Nothing about, uh, nothing about limbs or facial features or physique or anything else has anything to do with life. So the soul may look that way, but it's got, it's got to demonstrate some life. It has to demonstrate some life. If any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8 9. That spirit inside of the soul is what makes us alive. That spirit part. That spirit in a man is what you see life in. The spiritual part. Uh, you know, watch all these uh, movies, you know, where somebody gets shot and they, they lay real still, you know, so the bad guy leaves them thinking they're dead. Well, a lot of times people's souls are doing the same little thing, playing possum. It's just laying there. And there's no life in it. No life whatsoever in the soul. So the spiritual life is the first and foremost thing to demonstrate prosperity in the soul. Without the life, there is no prosperity. Just life, if there's no life in that body, there is no prosperity. No matter what he had, no matter how he looks, no matter what, he's not prospering anymore. He's dead. Life. Life. <clears throat> okay. 
Did Gainus have spiritual life? He did. Yes, he did. All right. <clears throat> the next thing is breath. I'm going to read this because it just says it better than I can say it. Free respiration is a necessity, necessary condition of health. It introduces the pure air of heaven into the lungs. The breath is an essential part of life. You can, do, you can do a lot of things, but you stop breathing, you stop living. That spiritual breath, that, and I like the way this, this author puts it, the free respiration. Now, actually these notes come from a long time ago. They precede hospitals, let alone the stuff in hospitals. But when you say free respiration, we know that everybody here knows somebody's been on a respirator at the hospital. And you know, you, you, you call the ER and you talk to the family and they say, well, they're getting better. Tomorrow they're going to take them off the respirator. And what does that mean? They can breathe on their own. Hallelujah. They can breathe on their own. There's a lot, of, a lot of good people that may still be on a respirator. You know, someone else reviving them, someone else pumping into them, but they're not breathing on their own. To have a prosperous soul, we have to be able to breathe on our own. Hallelujah. To take in that, that, that heaven, uh, the, the, the pure air of heaven into our lungs. And by the actions of the heart, send forth the blood and fertilizing streamlets to the remotest, the most minute and uh, extremities of the system. So the, <clears throat> so the thing about the breath part is we get a little bit more towards something that we can really see outside. We can tell if a soul is breathing in someone because what's the first thing you do if you run on somebody who's collapsed, you know? You get down there and put your ear down there and make sure they're breathing. And no matter how shallow it is, that's encouraging. Hallelujah. When someone you can feel breath. I don't know if anybody's ever been in that situation. It's, it's an awkward situation where you're actually trying to hear somebody breathe to know that there's still life in them. But when we get close enough to, to a prospering soul, we'll hear that breath. We'll feel that breath. You can put the spiritual mirror up to their nose and you can see the, 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 the breath that they're producing. They're receding into their into their hearts and lives. <clears throat> All right, moving. I'm moving pretty quick because of the last these five of these, and then one tag onto that five. I want to get to the, the last two because that's that's some of the most enlightening things I've ever thought about in my life. <clears throat> did the soul of Gainus prosper? Yes, it did. Then Gainus had spiritual appetite. Oh, hallelujah! I like this. I really like this part. The prospering soul has an appetite. And I think a big part of what I pray for this church and revival and the unprecedented revival in this church has to do with appetite. I, I've never worded it that way yet, but I think I'm going to put that into my prayer. You know, I say, Lord, make them hungry. I may just say, Give them an appetite and let their hunger take care of itself. Hallelujah. Now listen, let's look back at our, our individual we're looking here. Mothers especially. <clears throat> and a newborn baby, one of the most discouraging things that can happen, and I, I you know, the, the gene right at home, you know, we've got these little babies around there, and it's just exciting to watch a little baby. It's even more exciting to watch the mother. <laughs> Right. Little babies. <clears throat> but one of the things that you were, and, and I think Lindsay said something about a friend of hers just, just this week, just today she did this. On the way to work, she said, well, well, what does it mean if the baby won't eat? What does the baby, what does it mean if you have to force the baby to eat? And I'm not a doctor, so I avoided that question all the way around. I said they need to see some they need to have it checked and, you know, hope that you tell my friend to take, you know. Yeah. But, what does it mean when a baby won't eat? It means something's wrong. Okay, I'm not a doctor, but I do know this. If that baby doesn't get hungry, 
Something's wrong. If a spiritual person, if a Christian does not get hungry, and let me say, let me just be so bold as I say, if a Christian doesn't stay hungry, there's something wrong. If you, I know I'm not a pastor, I'm preaching to the wrong crowd here. But if you know somebody, I put it this way, if you know somebody that appears never to be hungry for God's word, if you know somebody that's a part of this church that appears never to be hungry for prayer, that appears never to be hungry for Christian fellowship, that appears to never be hungry for the word of God taught, preached, or read, there's something wrong with them. Their soul is not prospering. That soul that is prospering must have and will have an appetite. It's got to be fed. And I, I, I get a kick out of my wife and uh, Lily. Lindsay's not here, but if she's sitting right here, I'd say the same thing. Mama is going to make sure that that Bible is ready, and she's not going to check off on the time. Okay, she had a Bible here, so we have one here. Uh-uh. No. Fix that Bible and push it in them lips, and you'll find out what you need to know. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You, know, you don't have to have a stopwatch to feed a baby. Fix the Bible, stick it in their lips, and they'll tell you whether they want that Bible or not. If I, I, I'm going to address something here, and I know, no, I'm preaching to the wrong crowd. But there are times, there are times when things come up that you're not in church. Things come up, you know. <clears throat> uh, my youngest grandson's got a birthday coming up in just a few weeks. And we're going to celebrate it on Saturday, 200 miles from here. If we're not back for church on Sunday, come looking for us, because that's our plan. But we're fitting into his mother's schedule. If she had decided to have that birthday on Sunday, I suppose we'd went over there for the birthday on Sunday. Things come up. Okay. And church attendance by itself is not going to get you to heaven anyway. But Pastor Dennis, he was standing about right here, and I was standing right about here less than a week ago, and we agree on everything. We do. If there's something we don't agree on, we haven't discussed it yet. If someone is casual about coming to church, if someone has gotten so casual that, oh, yeah, I might come, oh, I might not, oh, I got this to do. I got that to do. If you got to that point, you're not hungry. You're not hungry. I'll say it. Tell them if you want to. You're not hungry. Uh -huh. Alright? Because when something comes up, when something comes up that, you, that I have to this church, I heard all over. I heard all over. Some things are hard to say. But several years ago, Brenda and I, how you say this, I have burned <laughs> over in Georgia on Wednesday. I'll tell you the whole story sometime. I ain't even about to tell you the whole story right now. But I have burned. Everything in it was burned on Wednesday. And there was people who looked at us like we were crazy when we walked in church that night. That had been out there on the side of the road and seen the burning embers and seen all everything we had was soaking wet and things that is, were precious to us and our clothes and, 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 and things that were just ruined because of the, the fire hoses and the fire. They looked at us on Wednesday when we walked into church like, what are you doing here? We didn't have any place to go but to church. We had secured a room for the night. We were my place. We, we had a place to sleep. 
We had we had clothes. We you know there was people coming to our rescue. But what was we gonna do besides go to church around people, praying to people, believing people? We were hungry to be in church. And I can tell you a few other stories like that. They're very similar, and they all come to the same conclusion. There's something about there's something about what you get in church that you cannot get anywhere else. And that appetite cannot be satisfied. That particular appetite cannot be satisfied anywhere else. You can say you sit at home on Sunday morning and watch televangelists all you want to. You're not getting satisfied. Your appetite is not being satisfied for what you need. Okay? It's not being satisfied. You may be entertained. You may be blessed. You may be lazy. But you're not being satisfied. And when the church doors are open for prayer, and there's what, four different opportunities? Well, count Monday, Monday through Saturday. There's a lot of opportunities to come to the church. And you say, well, pray at home. Pray at home. You better pray at home. I pray at home every morning before I get over here to pray. So when I get over here to pray, I've already prayed through. Hallelujah. Every morning. <laughs> I get over here. Sometimes I, I make a comment to pastor about, well, this is what God showed me praying this morning. Well, we're fixing to pray now. Hallelujah. Let's pray. <clears throat> if you're not, if you're not attending one of these, I'm not. You know, I'm not, I'm not the one to come down. If you're being satisfied with the praying you're doing, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you, there's some entrees over here. <laughs> it's not at the restaurant you were at. <laughs> okay. There's a, there's, a few, there's a few things on the menu once you get in this sanctuary and a prayer meeting that you can't find at the prayer restaurant you're praying at. Okay. It's an appetite that can only be satisfied in the, I don't like any of those terms, but let's say a, a concert of prayer, united prayer, what's the other one? You know what I'm talking about, <laughs> group prayer. I, I just like to pray with people. I just like to pray with people. Corporate, that's the other one, corporate, corporate prayer. prayer. <coughs> corporate prayer. I just, I just like to, to get in a group of people and pray. Hallelujah. You no know, what you call it? Hallelujah. I think he's called it a prayer meeting. But <laughs> meeting indicates there might be more than one person there. Hallelujah. 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 Spiritual appetite to gain us. It was gain us a soul prospering. Yes, it was, because he had an appetite. We've covered three. Let's talk about gain us. Let's talk about gain us just a little bit. I said earlier that Canis was had to have been up in years. In the early and the, the beginning of the church, the early days of the church. And we'll just talk about Gainus because he's the one that, that John was addressing here. He had to have seen churches that was hidden in people's homes at that time. At, at this point, he might not have seen that much of it, but he had to, you know, he probably went through some, some prayer meetings and some services in highway places. He had certainly seen a lot of ridicule. Let's say he was 70 years old, 70, 75 years old, and he got into this thing midlife. He probably saw this. If you read the same timeline in the, in the New Testament, he probably saw a lot of backsliders. He probably saw some people that had, had, you know, like the church of Galatia. And Paul said, you did run well. Who did he hinder you? You should not obey the truth. Gainus probably saw some people like that. Gainus probably saw a lot, as with anybody in any church. Okay? I'm just using Gainus here because he's the one that's written to. But if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably seen some heartaches. You've probably seen some fusses. You've probably seen some fights. You may have even been in the parking lot with some fist fights. I missed that one. Hallelujah. I know where it was. I know the people who's involved. Fist fight in church. Gaius has probably seen a lot of things. And John's writing here, I wish above all things that thou mayest 
prosper, as your soul prospers. Now, remember, Gainus is not Joe Cool over here. John is encouraging. His soul was prospering. Hallelujah. But even in a prospering soul, John, his father figure, his mentor, probably his assigned spiritual leader, it's possible. He was, it was it's possible that he could have been in the high up uh, below the hierarchy there with John. And that he was basing this prayer as an encouragement to someone who had withstood a lot of things and still had a prospering soul. Hallelujah. Because he had life and he had breath and he had an appetite and he hung in there. He hung in there. Like the uh, pastor was talking about the, the saints y'all incurred and encountered over Grants Creek. It was there when y'all were there young. They were still there. Hallelujah. That's a cool story. Hallelujah. The writer of the notes that I took <clears throat> said this, the prosperous soul is, ever, is an ever hungry soul. The prosperous, soul. the prosperous soul must ever be hearing and reading and learning and knowing, know, and knowing more about Christ. It takes in everything we can everything we can imagine. Hearing, reading, understanding, studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That hungry soul is going to be rightly dividing that word and studying to be approved of God. And it's going to be zealous for anything that can get now. Don't ever eat so fast that you eat the wrong thing, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a good amen back there. Amen. <laughs> don't, don't get in such a hurry sometimes that you eat the wrong thing. But if, you, if, you're, if you're in the Word of God, you're not going to eat the wrong thing. If, it, if it's based in the Word of God, you're not going to God this thing. <clears throat> Ask yourself this question. You don't have to raise any hands. But are you hungry right now? Are you hungry right now? I mean, are you thinking about something good to eat? I'm not talking about a big old hamburger. I'm not talking about, what was it? I mean, I saw my wife fixing something while ago. It looked pretty good. She told me just a little bit about it. I'm hungry about that too. But I'm talking about are you thinking about something good to eat? You know, my daddy used to used to have this thing when we would be on a road trip. We'd be getting ready to stop to eat. He'd say, All right, y'all watch these billboards up here. You know, we'd be going over to Atlanta. He'd say, I start watching the billboards, you know, and see the Jack's hamburgers for 15 cents. So good, good, good. Y'all don't remember Jack's hamburgers 15 years ago. Jack's hamburgers 15 cents oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. Start looking for your billboard signs. And have your mind made up. We're not going to pull in here and everybody be staring at the menu and wonder what they want. <laughs> Man, he didn't like that. He said, we're going to pull in there. Two things you need to do. Eat and go to the restaurant. <clears throat> <laughs> spiritual appetite I ask the question rhetorically you don't have to answer it but I'll go ahead and answer it I'm hungry I'm hungry for what God is going to do in this church I'm hungry for when Pastor Dennis gets back he's only been gone one day and I'm already hungry for what he encountered today he comes back and shares I'm hungry for for uh, everything that's going on. I'm hungry for prayer in the morning. You know, when I start thinking about coming over here to pray in the morning, I think about that the night before. 
Hallelujah. An appetite for prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to say one more thing about the appetite. We've got to move over. Ooh, we got to move over. Lord, we got to move over. The author of these notes made a challenge here. He said, <clears throat> if Jesus was to walk in the room and be talking to your friends, how many times would he say he's met you in a prayer closet? Jesus was just, you know, back there, you know, talking to the guys in the back, you know, and my name come up, and Jesus was leading the conversation. How many times, how often would he say that he has met John in the prayer closet? Hallelujah. You know, you know, you know that somebody's hungry when they stay close to the kitchen. Or they make a path to it. Hallelujah. Did, did the soul of Gainus prosper? Yes, it did. Did he had spiritual action? Fourth thing. The, the prosperous soul has action. It's doing something. And how many times has our pastor said, be a other and not a that's it again. Be a other and not a only. Hallelujah. A prosperous soul is doing something. Doing something. I and mean, then I mean, we forget, I went to work for the Alabama Power Company right out of high school and in between before I got ready to go to college. And my daddy, it's the only job he'd ever had. I told my daddy one time, I said, I know more about something you do than you do. And he said, what is it, boy? I said, I know more about filling my job application than you do because you only fill out one in your whole life. <clears throat> but my daddy was a general foreman with the power company. In other words, no matter who my boss was, my daddy was going to be their boss. That's kind of cool. <laughs> My daddy, I didn't realize why my daddy said what he said to me that Sunday afternoon until I was grown and a little more mature. But my daddy took me out in the front yard the Sunday before I was going to go to work on Monday. And he said, it's always something you can be doing. Don't get out there on the job and put your hands in your pocket and stare. Look around. There's something you can be doing on the job. My dad didn't want to be embarrassed by his son. That's what it was. I figured that out after a while. He didn't want, he didn't want my boss, his subordinate, coming to him and saying, well, John ain't doing nothing. There's always something we can be doing in God. There's always an action we can do. We as doers of the word, could you ever do all the word? <laughs> All we can do is strive, strive, strive to do God's word, to pray for the sick. Man, think about it. Just praying for the sick. Just, just are, are supporting something that's going on in the church. Or if everything's going to do it here, supporting some other ministry somewhere. There's always something we can be doing to promote the gospel. Buy you some tracks and get on the corner and pass them out. Hallelujah. Buy you some tracks and get you some envelopes and some stamps and mail them out. Get on Facebook. And instead of talking about, ooh, some of the stuff is on Facebook. Instead of talking about some of the other stuff on Facebook, hallelujah. Do a little preaching on Facebook. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I think between me and Brenda, our friend list is six or seven hundred people <clears throat> or more. So if something good comes along, we share it, and boom, it's out there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Dennis's picture was on Facebook before I got back to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> Just so his grandson could see it yesterday morning. That was so cool. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Spiritual actions. The author takes us, uh, these notes takes us to Ezekiel. I'm not, I may read part of this, but I, I, I want where he took this, the scripture to describe the actions that we can do. He used the river that Ezekiel talks about and how it flowed under the door to the east, to the west, to the south, and to the north. 
and how it flowed down through the river and, the, and, and the, how the, the shoreline of the river was prosperous because of the action of the river that carried the nutrients and the water that supplied by it. It's in the 47th, the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. And I'll, I'll read just a part because it's, it's beautiful. By the river on the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for thee, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to its months, because the waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit there shall be for me, and the leaf thereof for medicine. And we like trees, and are we like trees? Yes, we are. What we get here in church from our pastor, what we get from praise and worship, what we get in our own time along with God in our own devotion, what we get, maybe you, you got, you got a, a favorite pastor or a favorite person on TV to listen to. What you're getting there should be flowing out like a river. And we take it in in the action of the river. The action of the river is to carry something to something else. And, and, and the prospering soul is going to take the life, the breath, appetite somewhere. Hallelujah. The prospering soul is not just going to hoard it and hold it in. The prospering soul, like that river that Ezekiel was talking about, is going to carry it to someone else. Hallelujah. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. The fifth thing that the prospering soul must have growth. It's almost obvious. And you know, if you would, if you had to narrow this down to one point, that's what it would be. It would be growth. Because when we think of prosperity, we think of growth. You know, uh, someone who is prosperous in music writes a lot of songs, maybe. Someone who is prosperous in uh, business, his business grows. He starts out in a warehouse and winds up in a, uh, a skyscraper. Someone who is prosperous uh, and, and, and and whatever, if there's growth in it, Hallelujah! The prospering soul, the gain of soul, prosper. Yes, it did because it had growth. Hallelujah. Going back to the example of the babies, because this is the babies is really good for this. What a mother wants to see, besides a hungry baby and a baby well fed. There's a baby that's growing. Who is it? Lindsay. Well, Lindsay, just us get this on. She's going she to hear it anyway. <laughs> She's going to hear this message. <clears throat> because, it, it, you know, a little baby, whether it's a preemie, like uh, Lily, or just a, a full grown baby, like our granddaughter, <laughs> you still want to see growth. I, I don't know if you saw our granddaughter here the other day, but you, kind of, you want to see growth, but you want to see her trot around the track a few times too. And then wear some of that chubby off. But you still want to see growth. You want to see the, 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 the body grow into the, the head and the, and the arms grow and the fingers grow and, and the little fingernails grow and, and, and all that. You want to see that growth. Hallelujah. The, the mother content with her tiny infant should be should be tiny all the time. It's not, first of all, I'm not a good mother. But if that baby just stays tiny all the time, hallelujah, there's something wrong. If our soul is not growing, it's not prospering. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going, to, I'm going to wind this up by saying this. The guy that wrote these notes is pretty good. I'm going to go back and read some more of his stuff. But you know, he he had a five-point message here, and he does something that he really not supposed to do. If you say this five points, well, let's, let's, let's read you five points. Life, mm -hmm. breath, appetite, action, 
and growth. He put one more in there. You're not supposed to do that, but he did. I guess he got away with it. For the comfort and help of such a one, I would name yet one more sign of soul prosperity. Sensibility. Just sensibility. You know, we can have the life and breath and the growth and the action and a good appetite. But if that soul hadn't got that sensibility, just that, you know, what we used to say, common sense. We, we'll find ourselves a little off track. Sensibility. Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot about sensibility because I believe everyone here has a good sense. I'm persuaded of that. But I will say this. Hallelujah. Everybody you encounter does not have a good sense. Okay. When you get out there in the world, if someone has been run over by the economy, if someone has been trampled under by fear that we talked about here in prayer Sunday night, if someone has been trampled by the fear of getting in public because some idiot might have a gun and just want to shoot them for the heck of shooting them, if someone is beaten down by the economy because they can't see up, then their sensibility is affected no matter where their soul is along this line, their sensibility can be affected. And that's where the, the stability and the sensibility of someone is encouraging. Someone, the, someone you feel like, if you feel like you can encourage someone, then encourage them. If you feel like you're going to grab a hold of them and go down with them, leave them alone. If you feel like what you're going to say is just going to be run along with them, Forget it. But if you feel an unction from the Holy Ghost to encourage someone, then encourage them. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about a pity party. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about a pity party. If you know somebody that's, a, you know, let's just say that uh, wrecked a car last week and you wrecked yours this week and you just want to go over there and compare notes, uh -uh. no. If you can encourage someone, encourage them. Hallelujah. <coughs> I, I, I know I'm not going like to I have to read this because <clears throat> physicians tell us that there is a strange, I mean, physicians say there is a stage in the process of a disease, when the sensation of pain becomes the harbinger of death, so long as the sensation remains, there was still hope for life and health. But where the sensation has ceased, mortification has begun. <clears throat> when I read that, I said, whoa. But then I thought about, as my soul prospers, and I see a world of people whose souls are not prospering because of all this junk that they've allowed to come into their soul and into their life. And they're beaten down and they're trod down and they don't have any victory. And not only do they not have victory, they don't want to hear about victory. There's people that way. They don't have the victory and they don't want to hear about the victory. Because they don't, well, I'll, I'll leave that for the pastor. He preached to me one morning. <laughs> These people are crying out in desperation. They're crying out. They are hurting as if they had a disease of pain. And you can think of a lot of different diseases. I'm not going to name some, but I, I, know, I know some diseases by uh, people that I talked that, that the biggest thing about the disease is the pain. And hurting and crying in pain. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news if they're crying out like that. Because they still hope for them. Hallelujah. When someone quits crying, they're dead. Full circle. 
Here we go. In this world we're living in, we see people that are hurting and crying, and if you got, you know, you might want to pull both hammers back and say, well, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. But think about this. They're crying out because it's still affecting their soul. Hallelujah. When they feel it. You know, one of the first things they want to do when these wacko jobs get in the front in the park time and start shooting people, they want to find out where it was a church. They want to find out about his youth and its association. And they usually do. But that individual is crying out for something. And we live in a world where people are crying out. They are hurting and they're crying out in all sorts of ways. And we need to step in as our soul prospers. To step in and take their hand. Wrap our arms around them. Let them cry a little bit. And then heal them. Pray for that disease just like you would any other disease. It's a disease. Hallelujah. That's hurting. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. And we thank you, Lord God, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord God, that you put within us, Lord God, the necessities, Lord God, to render a prosperous soul. And we pray, Lord God, that everyone here, Lord God, continue to prosper, even as our soul prospers. But when we are confronted, Lord God, with those that souls are not prospering, when we are when we are find ourselves with family members or friends or co-workers, and we realize, Lord God, that they don't have the appetite that they once had or should have, when we realize, Lord, that there's no breath in their spirit, when we realize, Lord, that there's no an action, but rather a stagnant, when we realize, Lord, that their, their sensibility has been affected by this world, by the enemy of this world. We pray, Lord God, that we rise up and we restore to them, Lord God, through your word, Lord God. And we pray, Lord God, that everyone here, Lord God, would not only be a soul winner, but a soul restorer. And in our encounters, in our encounters, Lord God, as we are proclaiming revival in this church, Lord God, let us all be reminded, Lord, that many will walk through those doors with souls that are not prospering. And many, Lord God, that will, be, that will come in contact with this church over the next several months or even years, Lord, might not have a prospering soul. And we want to be ready, Lord God, to instill life, breath, appetite, action, Lord God, into their very being. In Jesus' precious name.